Well, good morning. This is Dr. Bruce L. Hartman, and I'm so excited today. Pastor Lou, my favorite pastor, is actually here uh, in my house. He's traveling from Jersey to Georgia, and he's decided we do the, uh, the vlog and our uh, podcast together in person today. So this is really exciting. So good morning, Lou. Morning, Bruce. Morning, everybody. It's good to be in North Carolina. It's uh, we live. I live in God's country. I guess uh, uh, Western North Carolina is a great city of Asheville. For today's episode, because Lou's here, we're going to talk about Lou, and I call Lou Jesus's sled dog. And this is part one of this series about Pastor Lou. He's very embarrassed that we're talking about it, but I want to I, I want to talk about a verse that reminds me of Lou. This comes from John twenty one. And this is the third time Jesus has seen Peter, and Peter has seen Jesus since the resurrection. And Peter had been fishing, and the Lord had helped him catch fish. And Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? And then Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, and feed my sheep. And the reason why I read this verse is I've known Lou for a number of years, and he's had that conversation with Jesus. So let's get to know Lou a little bit. And, you know, Lou, um, there's a lot of ways we could ask questions about you. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did Jesus move you to become a pastor? Because, it, you, like most of us, you worked. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you're running a church in Southern Jersey. How did this happen, Lou? Obviously, I've had a few careers in my life. This is my last one, uh, and also my best. But I felt the call in my life as a child and didn't understand it. Um, ignored it for many years. Went to seminary uh, in college, and um, then left because I was studying to be a Catholic priest, but. Um, didn't like the celibacy part too much. <laughs> uh, and uh, as we, as I progressed, I found careers, I worked, I did what I had to do, um, got married, had a good life, but there was always something missing. Was there a specific moment <laughs> where that something missing caused a crisis in your life, which made you move forward to feeding Jesus as sheep? Very much so. And, um, I moved back to New Jersey from Arizona, September 1st of 2001. I moved to a place called Highlands, New Jersey, which is across the uh, bay from New York City. So I watched the towers burn. Mm. And Highlands was the last ferry stop for the survivors to come in and be put into ambulances. And Middletown lost a tremendous amount of heads of household that day. I think it was close to 400. Wow. Um, So the sense of helplessness uh, really made me start to think. And I was introduced to a a small church in Highlands, and I started to go there. They asked me, because I was doing construction work, if I would fix their windows. And I did. Um, I said to them, when it came time for the final bill, I said, no, I'm part of the church. And they looked at me, but well, you did the work. I said, but it's okay. And I, I just enjoyed going there, enjoyed being part of the community. And uh, a couple months later, went to the pastor and said, what does it take to be a pastor? And he gave me a book to read, which is the typical way that it was done in that denomination. Right. And I read the book in a night, and I said, okay, now what? And then went through all the process. And there were some real stumbling blocks. My paperwork got lost. Right. Things of that nature. But God was still putting the call on my life. And um, I I had so many positive experiences from that little church. So it's, it's one of the reasons I recommend to people, find a church. You may not like it. You may not agree with the politics. You may not agree with anything else. But it's the community of believers. That's really important to build us up. You know, the church I go to, 
So there's only 30 people who go to church. That's a lot of people, 30, by the way, to the small church. But there's, when I walk into that church, I feel the presence of God. And I think that's what you're talking about. And the pastor, um, she's terrific, terrific. Um, and you can feel her love for her flock. And it is that for that one hour, I mean, with the community of believers that you're talking about. And I think you're right about this issue um, with going to church. So now, Lou, you've decided you're going to be a pastor and you had a journey there. And now you've set up this church called Church by the Bay. It's churchbythebaynj.com after almost 16 years of serving. In other churches in New Jersey. Right. So when you set up Church by the Bay, what was your vision, Lou? I wanted people to experience God. And I know this is two men in Jesus, but some people have trouble with the Jesus component. Right. right. But they may understand the Spirit or they may understand the Father and the Trinitarian. Right. So we, we can put that together. If I say God, I'm referring to Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the same time. Right. So I wanted people to experience God directly. And Church by the Bay was an, a vessel, a ministry center that was not going to be like anything I had ever served before. First off, we wanted transparency, which we have. We wanted a passion and enthusiasm for Christ and for people. Our mission statement is that we uh, love and serve God and we worship God by serving one another. It's very simplistic. It's theologically clean, but it's not very wordy. Right. Because we wanted people to experience God, not just talk about it. Church by the Bay, it's so much more. And that's what I want the listeners to know, because it's not like you go on Sunday, you hear a one hour sermon and you go home. That's not what Church by the Bay is. And they do gather for Sunday services. Don't get me wrong. But there are so many ministries, Lou, uh, that you conduct. But what are some of these ministries? Lou? What, what besides going to church on Sunday, what else do you, does your flock do to help your community? Well, first off, the flock is not just members. The right. flock is the community as well. Right. And because of that, we've been very cooperative with other nonprofits. We have a feeding ministry for pets. They collect pet food because when people are poor and they have a pet, that may be their only avenue to feel God's presence. Right. Because if humans have rejected them, the pet never will. But to keep someone from eating or from starving, we give them pet food, then they're able to take care of themselves as well. So it's building up their dignity. We have a food pantry that is totally um, private donations. We do not accept any money from the government towards it. And so we have that every week. We serve 30 to 40 families per week. Um, every Saturday, we have a group of people from... That's 15,000 meals a year. Of, yeah. Wow. We have a group of people that um, cook hot meals uh, and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and things of that nature for handicapped people that are homebound since the COVID epidemic because it was brought to our attention that these people who would go to day programs and be fed and feel a little bit of compassion and human interaction were not getting it because they were stuck at home. And none of the programs have opened up yet, so we've continued. I think we're up to about 18,000 meals. But what happens is that maybe, you know, you'll cook five meals, we'll collect them, we'll get them to the social worker, they'll get to the people's home, and they feel the love of God. So, so you get 15,000 for one group, we have 18,000 meals for another group. Uh -huh. My math is right. That's over 30,000 meals this year, uh -huh. all from individuals' kitchens. It's amazing, Liz. And then you, you do this clothing program, which 
I love, I love that. Why don't you describe the free clothing and how that happens? The clothing comes in again. It's it's private donations primarily. Occasionally, we'll get a, a you know a corporation and they say, "Can you use this?" But mostly, it's from private people. Um, we have a, a few people in the church that will come in and sort the clothes and. One of the visions that I, I tried to cast up front is that anything we give away has to be good enough for us to wear. Anything that we feed people has to be good enough for us to eat. Because if you're going to give them your leftovers, don't bother. Right. Give them something that has meaning to you and will have meaning to them. So we hang the clothes up. We put them on rolling racks. We roll them into the streets and people are able to shop. And what that does is it gives people a sense of dignity and it shows the compassion when they come to shop and they can pick something off the rack and and look at it and know that somebody touched it and cared about it they know they're cared for so they feel god's presence that way these are these are people that have had unfortunate events in their life it's not because they're bad people it's just an unfortunate event so uh, but you can't understand that until you give them clothes. And I think you can't understand that until you've actually taken the opportunity to listen to them. I know why I do what I do. And it goes back a long time ago when somebody sat down with me at one of these soup kitchens and they said, can't you get food during the week? And he said to me, pastor, I can get some bread, but I can't get nothing to put inside. Right. And from that point on, I said, no, we've got to feed these people. And that community now feeds people every day. Um, when we are able to give people that sense of dignity, it can transform a moment where they may be so far down. And anybody who says that, oh, they put themselves in that situation, um, I'll use a theological term, bullcrap. <laughs> That's the <one. laughs> uh, because some of these people, and especially in Atlantic City, there were domestics working in the hotels. The hotels of occupancy dropped to zero during the pandemic. Where are they going to get anything? How are they going to eat? How are they going to support their family? If it's not for the kindness and the love of Christ in the hearts of people, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, and that's the... I mean, that's the power. You know, Jesus doesn't ask us to ask them why. Jesus asked us to help them in their lives. And that's a, to me, that's the important mindset that you and your people have crossed is you're not there to, to judge them. You're there to help them. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. When he says, feed my sheep, mm -hmm. that's what he's asking us to do. What's your ministry goal? that everybody grows closer to Christ and actually emulates what Jesus was when he was on earth. Jesus was compassionate. And you can take Jesus' entire three years of ministry into three simple terms. He prayed for people, he healed people, and he loved people. Right? If we can pray for and with people, but I think praying for people is kind of a cop out sometimes. Right. I think a lot of times we need to pray with them. And if we can help heal their condition, you know, people say, well, you know, you're doing social works and you're doing this. No, no. We're helping to heal a human condition that causes pain and suffering. And Jesus came to alleviate a lot of pain. So, and then we love them. In whatever form we do, the primary goal is to show them God's love. Because we may or may not ever run into these people again. But I will tell you, when I see somebody in 90 degree weather with 90% uh, with, uh, humidity wearing three pairs of pants and three sweatshirts because that's all they own, I'm going to show them a lot more love than perhaps they've seen that day. Amen to that, Lou. Um, so, Lou, now we're going to get to a part of this conversation that I know will make you uncomfortable because you're only talking about yourself. So I'm going to ask you two questions. The first question is, and it's combined with the second question, how often do you talk with Jesus, Lou? And how patient are you in waiting for his answer? What I'm about to say sounds very strange. I don't ever stop talking to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
because I look at creation, I look at um, my life, I look at where I am now. I'm a vessel for whatever God wants. I'm listening for the moments, I'm listening for the opportunities, I'm listening for the situations where, where can I be of service to the kingdom of God? Because the kingdom of God is in fact here. Unfortunately, we allow evil to take over that kingdom to walk. And patience, I have zero. <laughs> so the, the reason why I ask that question is I think for a lot of us, um, you know, you, you have this prayer, you have this conversation with Jesus, and we tend to want it now. But many of Je- many times Jesus' advances are very complicated, mm-hmm. and we get to be, he's got to get us ready for the answer. And so uh, one of the things I admire in people like you, because you're more patient than you think, is you allow the conversation to play itself out. Now, Lou, is it more important to know that God slash Jesus slash the Holy Spirit is involved in your life? Is it more important to know that than to know the exact plan they have for you? And I really believe that with our ability to have free will, and trust in God, that puts together a new dynamic for life. Um, I trust God implicitly for my life, but I also know that I have a choice to make. What's my choice going to be today? Is it going to be to be compassionate and decent, or am I going to be a jackass? (laughs) You can be either or. Um, But when we are able to put the two together, our desires, our will. I start the morning off with a prayer of gratitude every single morning. Thank you, God, for waking me up. That sets my tone. When you can set your tone, the rest comes easy. Right. So for you, just know God's involved mm-hmm. is the most important. Um, so, Lou, the other thing that you do um, that, I, that we haven't talked about yet, and I think we need to talk about it. Every single morning, hundreds of us get this text message. The thing that amazes me the most is everyone is fresh and new, six out of the seven days a week. Now, the seventh day is Lou's Sunday, so Lou, that's the day he preaches. So we get six times we get this. How do you stay fresh every single day? Not to put pressure on you. No, prayer. Prayer. I have to pray. I have to get into the right frame of mind. And there are mornings that it's hard. Uh, if I've been at the hospital till two in the morning, I'm trying to write something at five. I'm praying a lot harder than I might normally. Right. But it's it's I've got to get into that intimate relationship with God um, to give me some some spirit. Give me something to to pull out. And all during the day, I mean, it's like when I prepare for a sermon. People say, well, when do you prepare for a sermon? Typically the Sunday before I have to preach. As soon as I'm done preaching, I start looking at what I'm going to preach on next week. Right. Because I don't think sitting at a desk is really helpful for me. I need to think about it in the realm of reality that we live in. Um, And look, I'm in North Carolina. I'm going to have a lot of sermon prep (laughs) driving around. (laughs) So the spirit moves you. Exactly. When you can get to that point in life where the spirit is moving you and you trust the spirit, you trust Jesus, you trust God, you know, that's that's where we, we get to. You also asked me why I do it. Yes. A uh, person who works in an employee assistance program for a police agency asked me one day if I would write something because he had heard me preach at a funeral. And I said, okay. And I started writing for him, and then he gave me a list of a couple more people to send it to. And then gradually, I started to send them out to people. And today, I put, it probably is close to 400 people that get them. And I, the one thing I do is when I send it, it's individual. And sometimes that's very time-consuming. Yeah. But I want people to know that every time I send it and I hit, you know, to click on Bruce or to click on Tommy, there's a prayer that goes along with it. So that you are in my prayers on a daily basis. Right. right. And, you know, that's amazing when you think somebody's writing this thing every day, sending it out individually to 400 people and caring about them, 
That's mighty work, Lou. Mighty work. So, Lou, um, we're off of you for the second, for the time being. Good. This week, this week, what's your message about working for the Lord? What, what's your challenge for us this week? Look for the opportunities. We have so many opportunities that come right in front of us. And I say it because I did it. I ignored those opportunities for you. There's opportunities for us to do God's work in a simplistic way. Right here, where we are, look for where God's calling us to do something good. So, Lou, if I go back to what you were saying, Lou, I mean, some of the things that I picked up from you is, you know, perhaps there's a place that you can donate clothing in your, your area. Perhaps there's a, a group that needs help cooking. You know, in many, many communities, so this, these places are overloaded now with need and they don't have enough help for the food banks um, or food pantries. And then I think also when you say look for opportunities, sometimes it's the everyday moments. Somebody needs you and recognize the opportunities when they are not what you think they are. Yeah, part of our Saturday morning hot meal ministry We've gotten cards and letters from the people that are cooking who are not members of the church. But how we saved their life during the pandemic because they had a sense of purpose. Right. Because they couldn't go to church. They couldn't get into community. They were very, very alone. We took the loneliness and transformed it into purpose. Right. So that was God's opportunity. Lou, as we as we close this um, session, you know, I'd like I'd like to ask you to uh, lead us in prayer as sure. a group. Let's pray. God, thank you for technology, for the opportunity to just talk about you and maybe maybe just light a spark, because we know that you have a purpose for all of us. We just have to listen a little bit better sometimes. So. Whatever we've done today, if, if this is what you want someone to hear, we know you'll make it happen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, this is Dr. Bruce L. Hartman and my favorite pastor, Pastor Lou, uh, wishing you a blessed and peaceful week. And don't forget to turn, tune in next week where we're going to talk about Lou and his street ministries that help his community. Have a blessed week.